Hello and welcome to Chapter 12 for PA 315, uh, Campaigns, Elections, and Voting. So the types of elections, um, we know the major elections in this country are two types. And you have your midterm elections and you have your presidential elections and they're every two years. So every four years of presidential and uh, between the presidential elections, you have midterm elections. And the types of elections themselves within midterms and presidential elections are primary elections and general elections. So primary elections, they vary by each state. And uh, as you read in the text, um, each state has different process for holding elections in general. And a lot of the power of elections under the constitution and the law is given to states. So the primary elections, you have a few different types. You have closed primaries where only the electorate of the designated party can vote for the candidates. Or you have open primaries where any voter can vote for any of the candidates regardless of the party. And um, we in California have something a bit different. It was called jungle primary and there's other words for it, but it's an open primary where any voter can vote for any candidate regardless of party. And then you have a runoff uh, for the general election where the top two candidates in California then are on the general election ballot. And this is different uh, from many other states in that in California, you could have let's say in one district, two Democrats who had the most votes or in some areas that are predominantly Republican, two Republicans. So that's, that's different than a lot of the other states. Um, but also with open primaries, you have in cases where uh, you don't have a, a runoff general election, you have crossover voting. And that's always the worry that that there's gonna be people in an open primary that will, from one party will vote for a poor candidate of another party just to stop the preferable candidate from winning. That's usually doesn't manifest in any real threat. Um, however, that's always the argument to have a closed primary. Um, a runoff primary, you can have in either closed or open. That's if no one party candidate receives 50% of the vote of their electorate for that party in the primary, then the top two candidates run again to establish the party winner. And this is similar to a runoff election in the general elections, like we have in California, where the top two candidates go at it regardless of party. And uh, California, as I mentioned, Louisiana, Nebraska, Washington do have this jungle primary, and uh, it's a top two primary to get the top two candidates to advance to the general election. This is a newer system that's been implemented and perhaps uh, more states will, will change to this, we, we will see. Uh, general elections, uh, generally the first week in November and that's with the winner taking office. And again, general elections, you could have a runoff if there's not 50% or more in some states they will have a runoff to make sure that, that we'll have two candidates to make sure that one has over 50% who takes office. So initiative, referendum, and recalls, these vary by state uh, very much. We have a lot of this type of activity in California, obviously, um, as we're seeing now with the recall of the governor is that's a common tactic by a minority party within the state who has recall um abilities to do this to uh put a control on the majority party so you see that happen often with republicans recalling democratic governors here um, and then in other states you've seen in, in michigan they've had recalls of governors where you have a majority of the electorate democrat however most the majority of the seats is usually uh, republican in that state lately though historically it was democrat uh, initiatives, the difference between an initiative and a referendum. Initiatives are placed on the ballot by citizens or citizens groups. And a referendum, a referenda, plural, is placed on the ballot by the legislature 
for a specific policy law. And you can also have a referendum that is on a current law to repeal it. So, and we see that in California. Uh, generally, as we read in the text, these are controlled by special interest groups. There's a lot of activities uh, with very organized uh, groups, especially within California, that run these initiatives and recalls and referendums because they have the infrastructure and the money to do so. Also, uh, you don't have the limits, which are now pretty much uh, a moot point, and we'll get to that in a second with the money. So you'll have tons and tons of money coming into these initiatives and referendums and recalls. So presidential elections, you have a nominating process. And it used to be that most states would have a caucus. Uh, that was the common way. And a caucus is different uh, from a primary. A primary, uh, winner-take-all primary, or a proportional primary, is more similar to a general election. A caucus is where you have long meetings and debate, and these occur between party officials. Usually it's well organized by district or even down to the precinct. And then each precinct will vote uh, with the people participating in this. And usually takes hours and hours. We see this in Iowa, the beginning of, of all of our presidential uh, election campaigns. And they will negotiate their candidates and, uh, and make it through. Uh, However, now uh, 38 states use a primary, only 12 use the caucus, and that is just a regular voting similar to the general election. Um, part of the primary system in presidential elections, as well as in midterm elections, uh, the more extreme ideologies of each group have a greater influence for both parties. Uh, so you're gonna see the candidates um, as well as the, the tone of the elections going to more extremes on both the right and the left as they are more involved uh, as a percentage in the primaries than the general elections, which have more of independents and moderates who uh, are the majority of voters. Uh, selecting a president, you have the Electoral College. We talked about this before. And... Uh, this is still the case. A lot of people don't like it. Um, each state has electors. And basically when you're voting in the general election for president, you're actually voting for your state to give the electors to one candidate or the other. Um, the electors are chosen by the number of senators and representatives from each state. And while the representatives coincides with population, senators of course does not. So smaller states have a tremendous amount of more power in these uh, in this system. So they're given quite an advantage over the higher, the larger, more populated states. Um, every ten years with the census, we have reapportionment, and with reapportionment, they divide again the number of congressional seats. Uh, based on population with each state. And we talked about that earlier in the semester where California you know, lost a seed and states that are growing more rapidly like Texas and Florida are gaining extra seeds. And that's been a trend for the last decade or so. The number of electoral votes needed to win a presidency is 270. And uh, that there, there's been some issues with that, not often, and uh, we've seen elections where there was decided by Congress because of an inability to reach that 270. Um, it wasn't 270 back then, but uh, the inability to reach the uh, greater than 50% number uh, that was decided by Congress in 1800 and 1824. And then the popular vote winner has lost in the Electoral College several times uh, in the 19th century, three times, and also twice in the 20th and 21st century in 2000 and 2016, um, where you had the George W. Bush having less votes than Al Gore, and then 2016, Trump having 3 million less votes than Hillary Clinton. But because of the way the electoral system is set up to favor smaller states, which generally are more conservative, 
uh, winning the election. And I don't see that changing in the near future. Um, and it would be probably not an unusual thing for a Republican to win the presidential election at this time in the next 10, 15, 20 years, though things rapidly change as we've discussed this semester um, and not winning the popular vote. Congressional elections take place in both the midterm and uh, presidential elections. Uh, Congress, the House of Representatives, obviously it's every two years, so every election cycle. And senators, you have a th roughly a third every um, Congress, every election, midterm and presidential. So th there, there are always elections during those times. Uh, staff support is very valuable for Congress persons, it's representatives or senators. Uh, they have constituent services, they're dealing with people as we read in the text, so they're building these relationships, they're building the networks, they're helping citizens within their district, um, they're building that value, a positive support network, hopefully, if they're good. Uh, there's visibility, their name is out there, the, the con con uh, congresspersons, uh, people know them, they've seen their name, they're going to local media, they're doing interviews, they're doing ribbon cuttings of, of different things. They have all of this free publicity. Uh, they also have generous uh, travel allowances and that allows for aggressive campaigning. Uh, this leads to the scare off effect. So because of the tremendous advantage an incumbent, incumbent meaning someone who's in office has in elections, uh, many high quality candidates don't even wanna bother to try to unseat them as they've already established a uh, massive amount of name recognition, funding, have millions in their in their war chest. They have the party already behind them in most cases. So it's very difficult to challenge uh, those people in the primary and even in the general election. So why incumbents lose? Because they do, but it's very rare. As we saw in Congress, it's around, they'll hold office around a low 90s percentage of the time. And uh, in the Senate, it's a little bit less. It's in the 80 percentage but still the vast majority will win re-election. When they lose, uh, that means they're running. Usually when uh, offices change hands from one party to the other, someone's retiring or there's been uh, redistricting that uh, in a state. So now the district is more one party than the other. Uh, you do have scandals that force some officials out of office or hurt the re-election, but that's not always. Um, we also have seen, especially nowadays in uh, the Republican Party, you have a, a, this fealty to the former President Trump. So he will, and people around that group, which have taken control of that party for the most part for now, uh, will run candidates against incumbents who don't support them or aren't vocal enough in their support. So that can happen. Uh, presidential coattails means the effect of when you have a president coming in who's popular, he's getting more of his people out to vote, he's all over the news and, and, and that. So those members who are in the same party will ride those presidential coattails into office. Uh, but this can also hurt in the midterms if the president becomes unpopular and, and many times that's when they lose seats, especially in the, if there's a second term of the president, the year six. So we saw that kind of happen with Trump and even in his first um, midterm in 2018. Uh, midterm elections can threaten incumbents, uh, presidential party generally. So there's a, there's a case to be made statistically that midterm elections uh, will be kind of this uh, revenge of the party that lost in, in two years after a presidential election, which will favor the other party. But uh, that's not always the case, but there is that trend. So why do candidates run? And uh, there's a lot of reasons, Pers personal ambition, it's their career, there's narcissism, ego, of course, uh, opportunism, unfortunately, they're building that personal prestige and fortune for future opportunities in the public and private sector. So they'll do something because they, they've plans later on for a higher office or um, unfortunately there's lots who will get involved and then uh, kind of turn that into a future where the private sector employer 
was you know, make you know five to ten times what they would in the public sector. Uh, you also have candidates running because of ideological objectives. So ideologies is very important. Um, usually a specific policy objective or interests in public service fuels them. It could be, you know, one or two issues that are very strong for that candidate. Uh, and also peer or public support. So there could be a lot of people around them saying, hey, you should run and, and supporting that person to run. Uh, demographics, as we will see, influence voters. There's a lot of differences in who supports which party and age, uh, gender, uh, race, ethnicity, religion, socioeconomic status, social background, uh, military service, all of these things have been found to highly influence voters. Uh, and then on, campaign, on campaigns themselves, the candidates, it's very grueling. And uh, you, as you read in the text, you know, you're talking 16 hour days sometimes and their personal lives uh, are under public scrutiny and it's, it's a very difficult, grueling uh, schedule and uh, they can get exhausted, leads to gaffes. And there's lots, if you go on YouTube, of times when candidates have done really bizarre things just because they were exhausted. The campaign staff, whether this is a president or running for Congress or even a state election, uh, you have a campaign manager. They're the number one working with the candidate. They're handling the day-to-day -day operations. You have a finance chair and they're coordinating the financial and accounting aspects of campaign, especially the fundraising. Uh, that's the most important thing, uh, which requires, you know, lots of experience and networks connections, you know, knowing the law is very important. You want someone who's a finance chair who understands the FEC, the Federal Election Commission regulations, so that you don't get in trouble. Um, and it's easy to get in trouble. However, it's not as easy anymore because of the breaking down of the campaign finance regulations that we've had since uh, 2010 and 2014 with Supreme Court rulings. Uh, so communication staff, uh, you'll have a communications director and this creates the media strategy with the campaign manager usually. Uh, you have a press secretary who coordinates with the press and the communications director and now very important, you have a digital team, usually one or two or more people, and they coordinate the online presence. And that's become more and more important. In addition, you'll have campaign consultants. These are pollsters. And what their uh, job is, is to you know, conduct uh, surveys, uh, look at data uh, from the constituents, the electorate, as well as from national data, and, and send that information to the campaign manager and to the digital team. And of course, the number one uh, asset would be volunteers. And they would organize voter canvassing, you know, door to door, uh, get out the vote drives, things of that nature. And that's gonna be the, the largest number of people involved with any campaign. Generally, they're associated with the party, but sometimes they're associated exclusively with the candidate. So we've all seen the national conventions, debates, and, and things of that nature. That's not always been the case. It's more in the last uh, half of the 20th century and the current 21st century. And uh, you have national party conventions, and they formally nominate the presidential and vice presidential candidates for each party. So Democrats will have their own, the Republicans will. In the past, some independent parties uh, would have them as well. The reform party with the candidate was Ross Perot. And they're basically designed to energize the party faithful, influence voters, as well as, and this was more in the case of the Democrats than Republicans, is to put forth a platform, agree on, on certain platform measures for the party and for the presidency. Uh, media is a, is a massive, uh, plays a massive role. And uh, you have generally horse race coverage for major media. This means they're looking at who's winning, why, you know, who's polling up or down, you know, that's like a race, you know, instead of the actual issues. Um, and the strategies to shape news coverage uh, that are coming from the campaigns include the stage 
events. There's also the spin, and we hear this all the time. The news is and the facts of a situation are spun, you know, not literally, but made into something that's more favorable for the candidate. Uh, we even saw in the last four or five years this tendency to have alternative facts, unfortunately, which means that facts in general are kind of just thrown out and then alternative facts are substituted. Um, social media now, as we know, is becoming more and more powerful. A lot of younger people are able to ascertain what's real and what's propaganda or what's completely bogus. Uh, unfortunately, most people over a certain age, including my generation, aren't as savvy at uh, you know deciding what is BS essentially and what isn't. And this is what brought about the term fake news. Initially, it was a lot of these um, phony news stories that were being promoted to predominantly support President Trump and his campaign, uh, but not all. They were also designed to um, help the Democrats as well as divide the party, the Democrats or Republicans. And the term fake news came from that. Uh, President Trump embraced that fake news and then made it his own and then applied that to any news essentially that doesn't agree with, with his campaign. And so then fake news was, was uh, taken and then made to use for actual more substantial news organizations rather than these uh, online bogus uh, news or propaganda engines. Uh, role of media also campaign advertisements, as we've all seen. You can have positive ads, which are becoming less and less common. Mostly there's negative attack ads, uh, which also include contrast ads. And then you have inoculation ads. So a candidate who's running for office can say, okay, well, I know my opponent and their party is going to say X, Y, and Z about me, but this is why X, Y, and Z are not true. And so that's an inoculation, kind of like a vaccine, hopefully that gets people the knowledge that they're not gonna accept some of the negative ads coming at them. Um, debates, uh, we think of as that's a normal thing and that's, that's expected. And it hasn't always been the case. The first face-to-face -face debate actually was in 1960. And that was Kennedy and Nixon. And that was also the first televised presidential debate uh, where Nixon uh, perhaps wasn't as savvy with television as Kennedy, whose family was very involved in the entertainment industry. And uh, people feel that those debates helped Kennedy win the election. Um, debates are important to both the nominating process, as we saw during the primaries of the debates with the Democrats and in the last election, you know, there, there were so many different candidates and they went on and on and there were so many different debates. And then you have the general election campaign where you have the two, one candidate from each party. Um, in the past, they have included a third party candidate if they were popular enough. Uh, that's Ross Perot in two different campaigns in the 90s, as well as prior to that, um, a Congressman Anderson in 1980, I believe, uh, where they would have in some of the debates, the, the third party candidate, though that's very rare. Um, media spin influences during the debates, oftentimes, unfortunately, a lot of the major media networks have become very partisan, um, especially Fox and, and, uh, and MSNBC would be the more, you know, MSNBC for Democrats, Fox is extraordinarily partisan for Republicans. And so they're going to spin, you know, who won a debate and this and that in each network and what they've done with media, as we've seen, unfortunately, is everyone kind of gets into their news or information bubble. And so they don't see an objective picture and they feel uh, through confirmation bias when they're watching the media network that ascribes to who they feel they're associated with, with their ideology or party, et cetera. And so they don't get uh, a very objective or open-minded uh, process to, to take in all of this information, which can be problematic. And that's not new. There, there have been media um, 
newspapers that support one party or one candidate over the other uh, for the last few hundred years. It's just a little more pronounced now, especially when you have uh, the algorithm set in with, with social media that uh, based on your activities online can see what type of things you, you like personally and uh, they kind of divide people into different groups and give them what they want to hear. And that was initially more of a marketing tool, but now it's being used for uh, elections as well. And uh, it's further creating these bubbles where people are in, in their own little world separate from reality. And it's, it's always good to be diligent, make sure you're uh, looking at the reputation of the source, if it's reputable, most of the information on the internet is not. And uh, also, you know, if there is some partisan bias that you're taking that into account and you're looking at more objective sources like NPR or even the BBC uh, from, from the UK is for more objective here because they're, they're not a part of our political system. And uh, your larger networks are okay. Um, CNN and MSNBC have changed since when I was younger. And, and that's not only them, but Fox News and many of these others, they've become personalities over principles. So it's all about which personality is, is reading the news or, or holding the, the news shows from whatever time, you know, that's their show rather than an objective uh, look at the news. So public funding is available to presidential candidates. We, we've seen that in our tax forms and it's $3 and it does not affect uh, your taxes whatsoever. Um, but this goes into a public fund and the idea behind the public funds was to take a lot of the fundraising out of the equation. However, it's failed um, due for many reasons, but to qualify the candidate must raise at least, this is only presidential candidates, by the way, not Congress must raise at least 5,000 from individual donations in 20 states, um, but they must accept restrictions on fundraising and spending, which eliminates a lot of private funding. And many cases since Obama and Trump era, the candidates just won't accept the matching funds because they can raise more money in the private sector. So it's not doing what it needs to do. 20% uh, of taxpayers participate, however. Uh, publicly funded campaigns, this is a proposal, it's not practice, some countries already do this. This is to take the whole fundraising out of the picture. I think for the most objective, and if we really want a real representative democracy, I think we have to move in this direction. Uh, otherwise, you're going to have candidates who are beholden to those who give them funds, which is the system we have now. And that means they're not really representing the people in their district, they're representing the interests of those who are supporting their campaigns. And uh, an extension of that would be the, the power of the parties and the parties inter, each party has their own network of fundraising groups in and outside of just campaign funds, uh, that you also have the outside spending. Um, and again, the candidate then is beholden to those, to the party or those groups rather than to those who elected that person, which makes you start to question uh, whether we have a representative democracy. And that's why we saw the dark money um, documentary. And, uh, you know, I think this is something that needs to be dealt with sooner than later. So regulating campaign finance, uh, this has been on the radar in our democracy for a very long time. And uh, there was a prohibition on soliciting funds from federal workers in 1883, part of the Pend Pendleton Act. And this was designed to not have federal workers essentially paying for their jobs. This was the end of the, uh, or trying to end a lot of the spoil system from the 19th century. And uh, you had the Tillman Act in 1907. This prohibited corporations from making direct contributions to any national political campaign. Of course, this was overturned by Citizens United. Uh, the Federal Election Campaign Act, this was uh, amended a couple times in 72 and 74, and it created in the, in the latter amendment, uh, Federal Election Commission, 
that was formed to enforce the election laws, because you can have the best laws in the world, if they're not enforced, then it's useless. However, as we saw in the Dark Money uh, documentary, that there can be some issues with the FEC, the way it's set up. You have three party members on each side, so six total, and if three disagree on, on looking into an issue of malfeasance, malfeasance then nothing is done and it's become extremely partisan. So if there's anything against one party, they, they'll all vote no. And so it's, it doesn't have the teeth it needs. Uh, this was to put limits and contributions for federal candidates and political parties. Of course, they can't, this can't affect the states uh, and also created a system of disclosure. So people know where the money is coming from and uh, created also the, the, voluntary public financing for presidential candidates that we just talked about. Uh, this was an attempt. It cleaned it up a little tiny bit, but not nearly enough, uh, because instead of just giving to the campaign funds of the candidates, now you had all of these individual uh, groups that were running ads um, in campaigns separate, but not coordinated with the actual candidates campaigns but serving them positively or negatively. And so the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, this was also called McCain-Feingold Act after the two senators, McCain Republican, Feingold was Democrat. Um, and this placed a cap on individual contributions to political parties so that you didn't have these wealthy billionaires giving to a party and taking control um, and that they could not uh, do electioneering. Electioneering means uh, between at the time it was 30 days and 60 day intervals before a campaign, you could not have these campaign ads that weren't associated with the campaign, but were speaking, talking about the campaign and the candidates uh, prior to elections. Of course, this was overturned by Citizens United, as well as McCutcheon and VFEC. And Citizens United basically came in and said, hey, corporations are people and money is free speech, so we shouldn't limit it. However, some small limitations remain for individual campaigns, but not for corporations or for any sort of election activity outside of the candidate's campaign fund itself. So what happened now, and then you have McCutcheon VFEC saying that you can't limit contributions from people to campaigns, it used to be they would limit it. So you didn't have one billionaire coming in and giving to every candidate running in one party to take control of the party. Uh, McCutcheon said, no, he can do that or she can. And unfortunately, they just opened the money for people to unlimited, have an unlimited amount of influence. Um, but because there still were some regulations to the campaign finance funds of the candidates themselves, we've seen a change from the predominant amount of money in a campaign coming from a camp uh, from the campaign itself to these large outside groups that function outside of the campaigns that will support or oppose certain candidates. So as we said, for individual campaigns, in, uh, individuals are limited to $2,700 per election uh, that's just to the federal, the campaign of the candidate themselves. They can give unlimited amount to different groups, which we'll get to in a second. Political parties, uh, they have joint fundraising committees. They give money through PACs to individual campaigns. Uh, personal savings, there used to be limits with the Bipartisan Act. Uh, that was overturned and there's no limits. A candidate can spend as much of their own money in their campaign as they wish. They said it's a free speech issue. Uh, political action committees of which now there's over 6,000 uh, give up to 5,000 per election to an individual campaign fund. But of course, you know, again, unlimited funding to other groups around elections. And these other types of groups are 527s, 401c4 or 401c uh, other 401Cs and super PACs. And uh, for 527s and 501C4s are just corporations, a nonprofit organization 
and uh, they're set up to be issue oriented. So they can't give money necessarily. They can't endorse candidates, but they can run negative ads and all of these terrible things we see. Um, however, a 501c4 does not have to reveal their donors. It's a loophole. And so a lot of money goes into these 501c4s, as we saw in Dark Money documentary, and then that money is, is laundered is essentially and given to super PACs, um, which say, hey, we got our money from this 501c4 because they have to say uh, who their donors are, but then they don't have to say who gave to that 501c4, so that's a loophole. And the super PACs and these 527s and 501c's now are by far the most spending and active groups in political campaigns, which makes sense after the uh, money is speech and keeping the uh, limits on the individual campaigns. So how has it changed? If we look at 2000, um, we see it's changed massively. So political action committees, this is money outside of individual campaigns, of course, uh, was 270 million in 20 years. The latest one, um, you're looking at 14 billion in 2020. I'm sorry, this is not the most up-to-date graphic. So you can see that the dark money or these 501Cs and super PACs and uh, 527s and PACs have just become the major, major spenders in any election. So looking at the 2020 election, the results by county, and you can see that most of the country is red because in those areas generally uh, are more rural areas with less of a population. If you look at the dark blue, and this has been trending for the last, oh gosh, 30, 40 years, if not more, since the Southern strategy and the split in the South, uh, where you see blue, generally these are larger cities. And the more urban area is more likely to vote Democrat, the more rural or suburban more is more likely to vote Republican. However, even suburban areas are now turning blue. Uh, voter turnout by race and uh, Hispanic origin. If we look at the changes uh, for non-Hispanic white, generally we're some of the highest turnouts of voters. Um, they and uh, non-Hispanic black are the, usually the highest. And you see in the last election in 2020, you had a massive uptick in non-Hispanic whites who, who supported, were more likely to support Trump. So there was a higher turnout actually for the group that would be most likely to support Trump. Um, Non-Hispanic black, very high voting percentage. Um, was down in 2016, didn't see the support for Hillary as you saw for Obama in 2008 and 2012, but did go up in 2020 for Biden, 3%. And sometimes these little bits of percentage make a massive difference as we've seen, especially in certain states. Uh, Non-Hispanic Asian was lower. However, in this last election you saw an, a rise in non-Hispanic Asian group tremendously, and they were far more likely to vote Democrat. And Hispanic uh, is usually uh, around 50% or a little bit less, was also saw an increase in the last election. So even though there was this increase in non-Hispanic white who support, uh, more likely to support Republicans, you saw the also increases, though maybe not as much, but as a group uh, in the, other minority groups who are more likely to support Democrats. And if you look, you're hearing a lot of talk about uh, voter suppression and uh, different voter laws. A lot of this, these laws that are coming out predominantly in, in uh, Republican states is because of this fear here. Uh, 88, you're looking at white voters being 85% of the electorate 2016, it's 70%, and I'll show you in a second, it's even less in 2020. And the percentage of Hispanic, Asian, and Black voters is increasing. So minority vote is increasing and increasing, and that's a trend that's not gonna stop. Uh, so that's created a lot of fear in, uh, 
in the Republican Party. And uh, if you see this is 2020, it's down to 66.7. And uh, the Hispanics increasing, uh, Black is increasing, Asians increasing, and those are less likely to vote Republican. Um, so there's that fear. So this is a lot of the engine behind these voter restriction efforts and some of the propaganda of the uh, votes, the election being uh, scandalous in favor of Democrats and all that. Uh, even Republican led inquiries in several states that are conservative have not found anything uh, supporting that. Unfortunately, it's become pure propaganda, but it keeps being repeated over and over, but don't, don't fall for that. Unfortunately, that's kind of a desperate measure. Uh, you look at the exit poll for the last election, men were just a little bit more likely to support Trump. That's down from the 2016. Women, of course, uh, heavily favored Biden and generally heavily favored the Democrats as we read in the text. Uh, white ethnicity uh, favors, heavily favors Republicans. Um, African-American, extremely supportive of Democrat. Hispanic, Latino, a little bit less, but still vast majority support Democrats. Uh, Asian used to be around 50-50, but Asian American and Pacific Islanders now are skewing uh, much higher for um, Democrats. And as you read in the text, you know, there's always nuance. So if you look at different groups, Asian is such a broad category. Uh, you know, if you're looking at someone from mainland China, they're more likely to support Democrats. If you're looking at someone from Vietnam who came over from the Vietnam War, more likely to support Republican. Uh, same with the Hispanic, the Latinx. If you look at uh, Cubans in Florida, they're more likely to support Republicans due to the Cuban Missile Crisis and, uh, excuse me, due to the Bay of Pigs and uh, the, the lack of support for overthrowing Castro in the 60s. So there, there's going to be reasons and different groups are going to be different, but this is just in general, in aggregate as a group. Uh, other, which is usually mixed, that's predominantly Democrat. Um, ages, and this has been true for a long time, the younger are, are more liberal and people get conservative as they get older. Uh, however, it's quite more skewed now than has been in the past, 18 to 29 vastly in favor of Democrats. Um, and that uh, advantage even holds with 45 to 64, which in 2016 was a multiple point advantage for Trump. So he lost a lot of those voters. Another area that Trump lost voters in 2020 were college degree educated, um, and they uh, favored Democrats by double digits. So this is a, a short uh, lesson, and uh, I just want to thank everyone for this past year getting through the pandemic and COVID. It's been crazy, and you guys have had to work in crazy environments, and, and us as faculty have had to put everything online, and, and it's been difficult, but uh, we're getting through there and looking forward. If there's some of you to see you in person next semester, next fall in classes, and uh, I will be putting together next Thursday the live uh, review of the study guide for exam two. So please show up to that, even though I will be recording, it's always good to have a few faces. Otherwise, you're just talking to a computer and you start to lose your mind a bit. But thank you all. And uh, hopefully I'll see a few of you next Thursday.